<laughs> but I probably did it. Like, oh, maybe we hit 100. What? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're kind of roboting a little bit, though. Hmm, okay. But as soon as we hit 100, we had, like, five people in chat this morning who've been with the channel, so they knew we were going for 100. Mm -hmm. And right when we hit it, I was like, yeah, and everyone was like, yeah, 100! And right. so I brought up the time of, like, hey, what are you getting? And like, what are very rough time to do? And we will we'll dress up. Like, what else do you guys want to see? And just immediately, like, three of the five people were like, Mike, dr we'll drink ranch! <laughs> it will be a thing in his life for as long as this channel exists. Our first corporate sponsor is going to be Craft to Orchid and Valley. Nice. Alright, it is 7.30. Boop! It's that time. It is that time. Aw oh, man, where'd the jar go? Damn it. Oh, there it goes. Why does that load so late? Hmm. Ah oh, man. Well, here we are with uh, the 209th episode of OK Podcast with Bad People. Yep. I, think, I think that's where we are. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. And uh, as you guys can see in the description, we are going to be talking about 1988's Die Hard starring one Morgan Freeman. The uh, picture is up behind us. Yep. And uh, our favorite musical moments in gaming. Mm -hmm. Or just music in general, good soundtrack stuff like that. So yeah, we'll start it off with uh, me asking Rob the ever important question. This being your first time seeing Die Hard, what did you think? Oh, uh, yeah, it was my first time. Did we want to do a news segment? I forgot just... about that. Yep, <laughs> let's do that. I I prepared a little bit. We have like a topic, and I actually made a very small game that we can play at the end. I'm very excited. It'll be fun. Sorry, so, I completely uh, forgot because you didn't text us to be like, "Hey, did you news things?" And I was like, "Oh uh, yeah, I, I just left it as a surprise this time." Then. Awesome. I love surprises. The, as much as Will loves ranch. Yep. <laughs> so not at all. No, Will loves ranch. He just won't admit it. He's Sundere for ranch. So yeah, I um. This is, I think, maybe like a two-week-old story, but I think there's some fun and interesting things to discuss, which is, um, like, recently Fox, of course, was acquired by Disney, mm -hmm. and we kind of got some information recently on a lot of the projects that Fox had going on that are probably going to be canceled now. And just, like, some of them... Um, I, I What I made here is a list of the, like, movies that they had going that are getting canceled because i think some of them are just funny because they seem like bad ideas but some are also maybe like potentially interesting um so i figured we could go down that list and then i have a little game for us at the end sounds good uh no it probably does not include fox news oh my god oh man i can't see chat on the playstation 4 right now no but that is an there excellent reference bonus points <laughs> Can I reach around and grab one of my pillows? I think I can. Come to me, pillow. Yes. We're going to use my fancy mahogany pillow today. Yeah. To give me front support. Ah, there we go. That feels better on my spine. Well, let's cool. go through this list. All right. So the first movie that I saw um, that's actually relevant to today's topic is a movie called McLean. Ooh. which was supposed to be a sort of simultaneous sequel and prequel to Die Hard. Okay. Where it went... Oh, I couldn't hear you there. Oh, I also couldn't hear you. You cut out. You're... Oh, no. Your internet needs to get fixed. Yeah. So you said sequel and prequel to Die Hard. Mm-hmm. Where... Where it would have... It would have had um, John McClane as, like, his... It would have had Bruce Willis playing the like old John McClane but he's solving a case that he had worked on previously um, before the first Die Hard. Oh okay. And so then they would have like hired a younger actor to play him like flashback sequences. Probably Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah. Looper. <laughs> oh that's that sounds cool. So yeah I 
Oh no, if you're saying anything, I can't hear you at all. I'm not. I went, that's cool, okay. and then you started talking yeah. and then stopped. Okay. Um, but um, So I guess they're um, working on a Flash Gordon movie. I don't know if that's interesting to you at all. Have you a seen new... the old Flash Gordon movie? Uh, I haven't, no. I think it star- stars... Uh... Oh my goodness! The dude who plays the the Russian boxer who f- fights Rocky, I think it stars him. Oh. oh my goodness! What is his name? I feel like I know this, but I'm not remembering it. I've never actually seen Rocky, but it's like such a well known. Oh wait, no, am I crazy? Dolph Lundgren. Yes, Dolph Lundgren, Lundgren but I was it. completely wrong. It does not star Dolph Lundgren. I'm an insane person. Um, so that they had an a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen reboot. Game. I would totally be. De- oh, I I think we're frozen again. Oh, um, did you say anything I mean, after League you. of Extraordinary Gentlemen? Uh, uh no, okay. I was just listening. I would totally be down for that. Hey, Dervic Dolph is. I thought the first movie, for all of its problems, had a bunch of interesting premises that I'd be willing to see them hmm. try. Try. Yeah, again. I remember like I saw it as a kid, and I liked it as a kid, and I've never seen it as an adult. I know people say it's not good, but I like only have memories of watching it as a very uncritical child and liking it. Yes, I was like that until I watched it as an adult, and then went, oh it's definitely definitively bad it's not like horrible it's not a piece of shit it's not like the little panda fighter of ensemble action hero movies yeah it's just there's not a lot of character development and some of the plot threads are kind of stupid and then sean yeah. connery's character is kind of lame hmm. but meh comic book yeah. movies before marvel's cinematic universe weren't very good yeah so what else you got so this one sounds genuinely terrible to me. The Sims movie. Like, what even is that? Here's my pitch for the Sims movie. It is okay, a movie a focusing on the Sims, but then the Sims start to learn that they are in a video game being controlled by like a mildly psychopathic 14-year-old girl. <laughs> and then they start to revolt and then they uh, infect her computer, eventually rematerialize, and begin killing people a la uh, Jordan Peele's Us. That would be a pretty funny movie. I feel like The Sims also could have just discovered that they were in my computer, because I definitely did. I killed a lot of Sims. It could also be like a very Mm. comically dark movie where it stays in The Sims the whole time, but in like as the audience we know that there is someone playing it so just like the life of a sim hanging out at a pool party where yeah a bunch of people are in the pool and then the ladder gets deleted and they all just have to watch their friends drown but everyone's totally okay with it like because like i guess i'm gonna die and they're like all right steve i'm gonna take your shit yeah it's not gonna be that but yes the emoji movie proves that anything can be terrible and anyone yeah. can be bought including patrick stewart I know. It makes me sad every time I think of <laughs> All right. What what other movies are in this list from this news story? They're working on Assassin's Creed 2. Okay. I um I wasn't the old one like forever ago that it came out. No. It was in the no. 2010s. I mean, that's a long time for like a sequel. Uh, let me look. Seven. Yeah, it was horrible. That came out in no, that came out in uh, 2016. Jesus, really? Yeah. And it felt so much longer. How could you not finish Michael Fassbender, Dervik? He's a treasure. So um, they're working on a. They were working on a Mega Man movie, which I'm gonna say if they based the movie off of the original cover for Mega Man, I would be really excited about. Uh, on a mild side tangent, I'm sure you haven't played it, but did you ever play a uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken? Uh uh-uh. uh 
yeah one of the characters was the og mega man character like thing and he's just like this big dumb bumbling idiot who's (laughs) he's as bad as you think he is that sounds awesome but all right mega man movie Mm -hmm. so we're working on a prequel to sandlot like where they're all toddlers yeah i don't know no details on it we just know that it was a prequel to sandlot okay gross yeah (laughs) there we go truckers movie a what ice road truckers oh okay because it kind of cut you just went a truckers Uh, movie and i was like i guess all right Mm. this one i'm just sort of curious about it was called untitled mcdonald's monopoly project i want to know what the hell that was i mean i know there was supposed to be a monopoly movie coming out Mm -hmm. like in the same vein of like when they made battleship starring rihanna yeah but i don't know and this was like a documentary about the corruption that is behind mcdonald's monopoly because there's a lot of it Hmm. but i don't know how many movies are on this list i I have two more and then we'll get to the game okay um so they were working on a play-doh movie like the philosopher? Uh, no. Like the um, squishy you... goop that comes out of a tube. So, the uh, philosopher? You play with as a child. Uh, yeah. If you think about it, all babies are is just squishy goop that comes out of a tube. Just as Plato would have said. And then the last one, which I would have been potentially excited about, actually, was a Caves of Steel movie based on the Asimov novel. I feel like there have not been any good Asimov movies that I'm aware of, but it would be really cool to see someone actually do a good Asimov movie. Wait, didn't he do iRobot? Yeah. Was that movie good? I never saw it. At, at worst, it was like an average blockbuster. It had some, it had some good stuff in it. Like the hmm. main robot character was pretty interesting, and then Will Smith was all right. And then there was a really cool scene where he has to run out of a house that's being like eaten by a construction robot. Oh, I Robot. Yeah, yeah. that that, was that movie Dick? though. No, you're right. That that movie like has barely anything to do with the shorts story i robot gotcha okay yeah i like don't even count that one as an asimov movie because it's like an asimov movie in name only it's it's an end of the story and that they both have robots in them okay Um, oh bicentennial man yeah oh did you not yeah i never thought you can't go that bad with robin williams yeah, Bicentennial Man was good from what I remember. I also remember it being very sad. Yeah. Hmm. It was a sad book, too. But it was a good book. Okay. All right. So, you want to play the game now? I do want to play the game now. Yes? Yes. No? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? So, um, Everyone's leaving because the of the internet. The game... Yeah, I can hear you now. So, I pick aren't like the movies we talked about before are all like established property these are i picked four movies from their list that are not established properties but that just had funny sounding titles to me and then i've made up one movie and so the goal of this game is you have to figure out which of the five movie titles that i'm going to read is the fake one that i made up okay title number one rent a ghost fake (laughs) <laughs> you're calling it already don't even want to hear the rest keep going uh title two the patient who nearly drove me out of medicine okay title three castle title four wait what was the previous one you cut out uh sex castle oh, okay. all one word <laughs> title four teddy sprinkle bum and title five fucking identical twins 
I feel like Rent a Ghost is a real movie. Okay. That one feels dumb enough to be real. Yeah. The patient who drove me out of medicine feels too specific for you to have made it up. So it's the last mm -hmm. three. Mm -hmm. Teddy Sprinklebum to me feels real because it feels like it's sort of embracing like uh, the sort of trend of really stupid like animated kids films like that ugly dolls that came out so yeah right now it's between sex castle one word and fucking identical twins yeah i'm, I'm gonna feel really dumb if i've already ruled out the wrong one <sighs> fucking identical twins feels edgy enough right now to be real because i'm sure they don't mm -hmm. spell it fucking identical twins like it's Effing. Yeah, there were asterisks in the fucking. Okay. I'm going to go with Sex but Castle, one like, word. Very clear what the title was. Gotcha. I have some bad news for you. Damn it. It was Teddy Sprinklebum was the one I made up. Okay. Fair enough. That one was also very goofy, and I'm like, thank maybe... you for playing any. What? <laughs> I just said thank you for playing the game, though. Oh, no problem. I was like, oh, that could have been a goofy, dumb one Robert came up with, but I can also clearly see, like, it's about a teddy bear, and then I can just see the yeah. the title wipe, Teddy Sprinklebum. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I did try to make one that I felt like would be believable. Well, you did a good job. Well, glad to hear it. All right, so is that the end of the news segment? Uh, yes. All right, so... Rewinding back to the first 20 seconds of this podcast, Robert, you've never seen this movie until now. What did you Correct. think of Die Hard? I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I um, generally am not a big fan of like straight action films where like the big hook is guys shooting at each other, but I really liked this movie a lot. I have some thoughts about why that is, but I don't know if we want to jump right into that or uh, i mean we can really kind of go wherever do whatever yeah uh yeah it was a movie when it came out surprisingly because i'm growing i was born after this movie came out born yet before yeah this movie came out because well, of 82 right 88 88 so a year before you two before me actually less than two before me because it was i think it came out around christmas the year it came out um but I've always grown up hearing Die Hard as being like this definitive American action film, but I guess when it came out, it had very like mixed reviews. Huh? Yeah, uh, like Robert. I don't know because. Oh, sorry. Well, I'd actually I'd seen that Roger Ebert one that you're about to refer to, right? Yeah. Because I think what was that um, bad reviews were pretty rare. His was like one of the exceptions, and he actually came back later and changed his opinion on the movie, didn't he? Oh, I don't know for sure. I was I did a quick look at uh, Wikipedia and then some other things, and I was like, oh, really? This was a mixed review sort of movie? Hmm. But, uh, yeah, don't 100% quote me on that. Just pull that up again, see what I'm talking about. Yeah, Die Hard, Critical Reception. Yeah, like it, it at the time, it the hmm. reviews were mostly positive. They just weren't like one hundreds. Yeah, I gotcha. There was like a lot of sevens across the board, but looking back on it now, it has become like a quintessential action film, and uh, regarded by many, including myself, as the best Christmas movie ever made. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, was talking to one of my roommates, and they said that that was a question that we really needed to try and answer on this podcast. Was whether or was not it was a Christmas movie. Whether it was a Christmas movie, yeah. I mean, it's not a Christmas movie, and I'll fight anyone who says it is. Just because it's happening around the time of Christmas does not make it a Christmas movie. Yeah. But I would rather That's about... I feel like it's acceptable in the place of a Christmas movie, but I wouldn't call it a Christmas movie. I would rather watch this than any other Christmas movie. Yeah. I guess um, the one like non-conventional Christmas movie that I feel like you could call a Christmas movie for the same reasons mm -hmm. that I like 
better than this is Tokyo Godfathers. Yes. Well, uh, that one I would call a Christmas film. Yeah. That one. I mean, like embraces it, the imagery and a lot of the message of like Christmas spirit and stuff. That's true. Yeah, I would call it non-conventional, probably correct, especially since it's in a non-Christian society. But I would say that is very much a Christmas movie compared to this one. Yeah, for sure. But all right, uh, sure. Let's. I'm happy with starting with why do you think you liked this more than you thought you would? I think that the characters in this are written way better than in the vast majority of action movies. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't want to say that they're all like super complex and nuanced characters because I don't think that they are No, but they have like clear understandable motivations and like in every single scene you can understand why they're doing what they're doing and like you can sympathize with what they and I feel like that just like makes it a lot easier to f- get into the movie for me that makes sense um, i i would say like around this time the other big like probably the biggest action star possibly ever would be arnold schwarzenegger yeah and from all of his movies there aren't really any characters it's him the bad guy who is evil for evil yeah. reasons and then all of the like There'll be some, like, fun, goofy side characters who have a line or two, or there's, like, the sub-bosses who have, like, one evil line or deed apiece before Arnold Schwarzenegger throws them off a cliff or something. Yeah. Like, Predator is a good example of that. There's, like, six characters that you meet, and they all have a discernible trait that you're like, that's the dude who dry shaves, and that's the guy who's a sexual tyrannosaur. And then they all die really fast, and it's just a big angry horrible monster in the jungle fighting the predator yeah that was my joke for today (laughs) um but yeah this one hans gruber is a villain that a lot of people when they talk about good movie villains is still brought up today is he's a dude with a plan and there's also kind of like a weird sinister charm to him yeah he's very intelligent yeah he's really compelling and um like more what he's doing feels more clever than a lot of movie villains Mm -hmm. and like he's villainous but i also kind of appreciate that the scale of this movie isn't like left the entire earth he's just like a thief who is willing to kill a bunch of people to pull off a kind of clever heist because to me like in when i look at him if his heist went 100 percent according to plan Mm -hmm. no one would have had to die i don't think that's true though because like the end of his plan is that all of the hostages are up on the roof and they all get blown up oh, they in do. the explosion. And that's why the police never chase after them is because they think the terrorists also died in that explosion. And it's impossible to like pick apart what's are from the hostages and which are from the terrorists. Okay, I may have misremembered. Because I know he's trying to fake the deaths at the end, but I thought he did the yeah. hostage thing because everything else got out of control but i may have misremembered that i just remember like he kills the first guy the the guy who like runs nakatomi plaza just because he won't cooperate yeah and then he kills the other dude because he just kind of gets in the way while trying to help so he kills him but yeah i guess i must have forgotten well i guess it's that like his plan to blow up the top of the tower only makes sense if that's why he's doing it that okay yeah i'm probably wrong then never mind Because that, like, like what you're saying about if his plan goes perfectly, it absolutely wouldn't been for John McClane showing up. Because, like, he perfectly predicts the Mm -hmm. admittedly completely 
stupid plan of the FBI to send in gunships for some reason. Um, it's because it was the 80s, man. Everyone was high on cocaine. Yeah. But that's the thing is, like, he knows exactly what the police are going to do because they're following a book and he has read their book. And so, like, everything that they're do is, doing is playing into his hands. Mm hmm. Uh, just like, the part to me that always stands out when I think about Hans Gruber is the scene near, like, it's like in the last third of the movie <laughs> when uh, John McClane, like, f meets him for the first time and doesn't know that he's Hans Gruber. Yeah. And he pretends to be, like, an American who's really scared. And yeah. he, like, changes his accent. And I was like, that's really good. Yeah, that is a really good scene. I learned something um, pretty interesting about that scene, too. Which is... So that scene was the first scene that Alan Rickman shot at shooting the movie. Huh. Mm -hmm. And apparently on the, like, for part of the scene, he's, like, jumping off of a three-foot high thing. And he injured his knee on the first day of shooting and his doctor told him that he couldn't put any weight on the leg. So like the shots are all from places where you can't see him standing because he's standing on one leg for most of that. Um, huh? Through most of that footage. Yeah. Cause he couldn't put any weight on the other. That's nuts. I didn't know about that. Like the yeah. big goofy piece of trivia that I know is like, this was this, I think, for Alan Rickman was his first film. Yeah. And then I think this was also like Bruce Willis's big yeah. like he's the star film. Mhm. Mm Which Yeah, he, he um awesome. had had only appeared on British television before. Mm. So yeah, he hadn't been in any feature films or any Hollywood movie. Gotcha. But yeah, uh Trying to think of some other stuff. Did you have uh, any other things that you were saying on your point? Sorry about why you really liked the movie. I um, also really like the like. It feels like it's a movie that actually has some um, things it want to it wants to say. Some like thematic elements, and I don't know that I agree with all of its thematic elements, but I at least appreciate them being there, and that like. I think it's a move trying to um, cause the viewer to think about like how things used to be and how things are now. That's mm -hmm. like a a big um, part of John McClane's character arc. You know, is he's like this cop from New York who's used to always doing things the way that he used to do them, and now he has to go to L.A., which is this weird, crazy place. Um, you know, and there's like a lot of commentary about how weird LA is and also just like the culture that his wife is working in um, you know and um, he will just talk a lot about how he kind of likes to do things the old way and I guess there was some other symbolism like when he finally defeats Hans Gruber the like final thing he does is removing his wife's Rolex, which is kind of like a symbol of her involvement in that newer world. Um, so I guess I found it at least interesting that there's that play between them in the movie. Oh, I do. Speaking of like the culture of being weird, but it's like the time where there's that pregnant woman at the very beginning at the party, and she's like very pregnant, and she's like, "I'm drinking for two and she's just drinking away. <laughs> while super preggers and i was just like i was like i can't tell like is that a joke or mm. is it like at the time yeah in the 80s people were like whatever be pregnant and drink it's fine yeah i don't actually know when the timeline is of like when it would became common knowledge that you shouldn't drink while pregnant but yeah but. Uh, watching that again i was just like oh so goofy <laughs> But uh, what are so, you're saying, like, themes that you don't agree with? What, what are you talking about? Well, I guess I meant, like, I feel like the I, the theme of 
maybe things were better the way they were before is like very conservative um which like i think the way that duddle and not offensive but at the same time like i don't know that if you said to me the theme of this movie is that things were better the way they were before i would be like "Mm, that's kind of ooky but um from a technical standpoint very ooky yeah (laughs) but like like i said i don't think that's super pronounced in this movie and it may not even be something they intended like it's what i'm trying to read a lot more into this movie than, than it really wanted to tell me um just because that's what pretentious assholes like me do but <laughs> yeah it happens that's why that's yeah. why we love you <laughs> there we go Just trying to get but yeah like i do think though it was the strength of the character writing for me that really made this movie feel great It's definitely really good. Uh, I'm trying to think of some specific moments. I really like was it resizing us on the fly as we go. No one cares. No one's watching. There's only two of us here. Uh, I had to, yeah, I had to turn mine off um, to make the internet less poopy. That's totally fine. I'm sure for like the seven people who might stop in here for half a second, they'll appreciate that more than uh, poopy internet. Yeah is uh, the character, I forget his name, I only know him as Carl Winslow from Family Matters. The uh, cop. Powell. Powell. Is I believe this was the, the role that got him uh, Family the Family Matters TV show. Hmm. Because uh, this came out a year before Family Matters started. And huh. I did not do enough research to conform it. Conf- confirm it because I'm a professional. Is Because uh, he plays a cop in that show as well is and it's also in california is what i heard is the original idea was he was supposed to actually be in the original draft like the same character <laughs> but then obviously that's not true because it's pal and winslow yeah. i don't know what was going on but that Could would be funny fun. if it was if yeah the one time just too many times urkel comes over and he just snaps and shoots the wrong kid again I did learn that because of this movie and the sequel, um, he now, like, people will throw Twinkies into his car and just, like, throw Twinkies at him and stuff because his character liked Twinkies in the movies. Huh. I don't yeah, know if that I'd was be just, mad like, at that. A thing that he apparently commented on in some of the director's commentary video or the, like, commentary track of one of the DVDs, I guess. He was like, yeah, people are always throwing Twinkies at me now. Nice. Stock up for the apocalypse. Indeed. Uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about the most was uh, John McClane's feet. Yeah. Is this movie, Is when I saw it the first time I was a dumb little kid and didn't think about anything, is this movie has like a weird fascination with his feet. Hmm. Um is it starts at the very beginning of the movie when he's in the air when he's on the airplane and he's getting off and that passenger is like hey man to kind of ease whatever it's jet lag or something you make balls with your feet on the carpet yeah but then the rest of the movie is just little little piggy went to market torture porn <laughs> for his feet which i can't imagine yeah. Green tarantino enjoying this movie at all i mean there is like a bit that i found funny with his feet too where he was trying out the ball of them up thing and he's just like son of a bitch <laughs> yeah because it works and he's like oh. <laughs> i was like yeah he's like feet he like walks on glass yeah they get burned a little bit he like i think bruce willis actually fucked up his foot during the sequence when he has to like use the hose to swing off the top of the thing and he smashed into hmm. the wall uh because I'm pretty sure the swinging is a stunt double. I don't know, but just during that stunt, I heard that he hurt his foot. Huh. But his feet are such an apparent thing that I'm pretty sure that you know what I'm going to be talking about. Is, did you ever see the Angry Video Game Nerd video on the Die Hard game? 
I've, I've, I've definitely seen it, but I don't remember it specifically. Is because he plays it and like you have a health bar, you have your ammo bar, but then you also have a feet bar. <laughs> That's like, really great. <laughs> the health of your feet is like a gameplay element and you heard it by like stepping over glass or on traps and stuff. Hmm. So when the people were making that game, probably LGN, I don't know. Yeah, We're like probably there, there was so much feet in that movie we have to put it in the game yeah but yeah that was that was the thing that i was like oh man die hard f- foot torture porn yeah apparently bruce willis has said like the scene where he's pulling the glass out of his feet still makes him cringe although i know with a lot of the glass foot stuff that was actually like a prosthetic skin that got put on over his foot that the glass was in mm-hmm. but yeah that's a that's a pretty common trick thing they do when there's stuff protruding out of your skin yeah wait you're telling me they didn't actually shoot chunks of glass into their real actors no because no, uh, they're not stanley kubrick that's what uh, <laughs> stanley kubrick uh, was it kurosawa who had them get shot at with real arrows I don't know. One of I don't remember that story. Yeah, that's but. the thing for some directors that they actually had real arrows falling down at them while they were acting. Ooh, uh, that's I don't like that. No one got hit, but I'm that's sure just. About that. I remember hearing about that in one of my film classes, and I was just like, nope, no, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a movie that there's really not to me a whole lot to talk about. It's. A solid action movie. I mean, I think there are, like, specific scenes or, like, um, trails of plotline that could be worth talking about. Yeah, if you have anything, just take the lead on this one. For me, it's I don't have very much to talk about. Okay. I've seen it. I think this is, like, the fifth time I've watched this movie. Yeah. And I'm just like, it's what it is. Yeah. So, like, I really liked the um, way that they show Holly and McLean mm-hmm. that like it's kind of when they first um, meet back up and they're kind of like happy to see each other at first and then like he says the wrong thing and it just flips so fast felt really believable to me I liked that scene a lot and I'd read a thing where the lead writer on the movie had been kind of inspired by um, a real life near death event where he had been like, he had had a fight with his wife and gone out driving late at night. And I guess a box fell off of a truck ahead of him in his car. And fortunately it was an empty box, but he had that thought of like, I could have died tonight and never been able to apologize. And so he, wrote the move the script for the movie which was an adaptation of a book but he really wrote it with that motivation in mind for the characters holly that they're a couple who has had had an argument but who want to reunite i can see Uh, that that's cool yeah i um i did like that powell had like an actual arc to him too Mm mm-hmm um, it felt a little bit cheesy to me that the end of his um, as the like response to the sort of I don't even what know what you call it in an action movie, but it would be like the kill that gets you after you think you're safe in a horror movie, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, there has to be a name for that. Yeah. But yeah, just the um, the fact that you like get to know him over the course of the movie you connect with him you learn his backstory and then his backstory has a resolution in the movie i think is really cool for like a side character and one of the things that i learned was that apparently bruce willis was shooting another movie at the same time as die hard oh and he was super exhausted from that filming schedule doing two movies at the same time so they had to like create media roles for a lot of the side characters because of that something that the movie really benefited from some uh, necessity is the mother of pretty good side plots and in movies indeed I um, 
I liked a lot of the humor in this movie also. This, yes, this movie has like a sense of humor in it that I feel that Bruce Willis just carries with him through all of his other movies. Yeah. Up until the new shittier ones that he's been in. But (laughs) yeah, like this. Well, it's like Willis, but there's like other characters too that I think have really great bits of humor. Like um, in this... In the or even just the bits of humor, like in the scene, Powell is getting shot at out of the building, and he's driving his car backwards and like in terror, and then it just cuts briefly to like Argyle in the car chilling out. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, Argyle, that was his name. Yeah, I, I thought his name was Theo. Or um, that scene when the SWAT team is about to the Nakatomi Towers, and the the terrorists are like inside setting up and then one of them like looks into the counter and steals a candy bar out of it to eat i found funny i mean i would have stolen that candy bar i guess if you're stealing a a shitload of barabons you might as well yeah man you can't be spending all that money on nestle crunch (laughs) but yeah i uh that scene I learned apparently was another ad lib scene where like the actor had the idea that it would be funny. Um, but I found it a little cute because he like asked for permission because he was afraid he'd get yelled at for taking candy bars if he didn't. That is funny. I I would probably be like that too. I'm like, can I do can I do this? <laughs> can I has this candy bar? What was the candy bar? I don't even remember. I think it was the Nestle Crunch bar. Nice. Which is a good pick. I like Nestle Crunch. Even still, even though it's not Nestle Crunch anymore. Oh, it's not? No, they changed that because it's owned by different people and the proprietary recipe isn't hmm. theirs anymore. Yeah, Nestle Crunch was gone for like a couple years. Oh, man. And then they got bought back up by a Japanese company that's like, this is Nestle Crunch, but not it really. I <laughs> see. Yeah, I like those. I liked the like bunch of crunch that you could get at movie theaters too. Yes, bunch of crunch, and then I yeah. liked Butterfinger BBs. Yeah, both gone now. What can you do? Build a time machine. You can do that. Or, or we could just take over a, a plaza, and then there should be a crunch bar somewhere. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. I think, um, did you have any criticisms with this movie? Uh, I mean, it's a movie that's hard to be super critical about it because there's stuff where I'm like, oh, this is unoriginal. I'm like, wait, no, at the time, this may have been the first. It's a movie that so many movies have, like, held down and taken stuff off of that I have to remember that, oh, this is maybe the first time it's happening. So it's hard for me to critique it. Hmm. I, yeah, and compared to other action movies that I've seen and I really like that are more complex, this movie can feel kind of simple at a time. Hmm. Um, John McClane kind of his character was kind of inconsistent at times, like when he killed that dude and then like wrote on his chest, "Ha ha, now I have a machine gun." Yeah, that seemed a little weird and out of character, kind of maybe. I don't know if I. Yeah, I guess if you want to accept the thought that like he's trying to play 3d chess a little bit and just Mm -hmm. scare the terrorists and get them moving so that then he can play off of that um but it is like a very i i get the like maybe it's a little bit too clever for his character if you're supposed to believe like he's just a new york cop Mm -hmm. who was at the wrong place at the wrong time uh, I know it's a movie because I it was a series that I watched for a while. I don't think they make it anymore where they have like a Hollywood doctor watch an action film and then say all the parts where like no that person would have died. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a movie that's pretty bad about like having things that happened in it that would have killed John McClane. And now that I know that, I can't unknow that. They're like the he wouldn't have survived the helicopter scene. Like the pressure wave of that explosion would have just thrown him off the building. Yeah. If and then they're like, if he hit that glass so hard that it shattered, like swinging down onto it, that's not like glass. That's like plexi whatever. He has shattered his entire arm, and he would have fallen off and died. Yeah. But 
No, I'm sure there are, but to be, I will be completely honest. I watched this movie while I was working on stuff for a game script that I need to talk to you yeah. about after this, because I remembered so much of it. I wasn't like paying super mm. critical attention because I was like, it's Die Hard. Yeah, it's the Die Hard. It's the movie that they made a remake of with Channing Tatum, where he's in the White House, and it was okay. But what about you? What do you? What critiques? Do I you had have? I think two criticisms. Right. So one I sort of alluded to earlier, which is just that the cops in this movie, every cop stupid. in this movie except for Powell, is so fucking dumb. Yeah, mm. it's so frustrating to watch them because, like, I don't know if I have an enormously like, I don't expect real cops to be like brilliant tacticians, but like the stupidity of the cops in this movie goes beyond like cartoonish. It's so dumb. Um, so that was one. My other complaint is a complaint specifically with the version that I rented from Amazon, um, which is that the audio mixing is fucking horrific. Oh, okay. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. It was like some of the worst audio mixing I think I've ever heard. Where, like, there were parts of this movie where, like, at the same, with my TV at the same volume, it would be so loud at some parts that you could hear it from, like, other places in my house, even though, like, the door is closed to my room and shit. And then there were other parts with my TV at the same volume where, like, if I had not turned subtitles on, I could not have heard what characters were saying at times when you're like clearly supposed to be able to hear it. You heard Which, like, Bezos, fix it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like, that may be a thing where they have just left the theatrical audio mixing. Um, Cause my understanding is like, when you have those sorts of problems in a movie, it's because the mixing is either still for the theatrical version or it assumes that you have an actual nice on your TV that you're not using the default TV speakers. Um, and for people like me who use the default TV speakers, movies like that really suck. Um, and I've seen a lot of movies that do that, but this is by far the worst um, gotcha. that I can remember having seen. Uh, you brought up a thing that I want to talk about with those cops being dumb, with a weird theory mm -hmm. I've had and I've read some stuff. The other thing I want to bring up is, so you, I'm sure you watched the full R-rated version of that movie. Yeah. So you you now know John McClane's signature catchphrase. Uh, the yippee, yippee kaye motherfuckers? Yes. And, yeah. Uh, that being one of my favorite bits of edited for television is uh, yippee kaye Mr. Falcon is the best thing I've heard because that makes no sense. But if you look that up, I think it's actually yeah. not in, I don't think they do that in Die Hard 1. I think it's actually in Die Hard 2. They go to Yippie Kaye, Mr. Falcon. But, yeah. Uh, but the thing with the dumb cops uh, is I've seen people sort of talk about this is in 80s action movies, the dumps like the characters that always get killed by like villains and they're establishing like moments of these are villains are either cops or security guards hmm. because to us they are figures of like authority and order and they're supposed to protect us and if they're if these bad guys have the ability to kill them then who can save us yeah the the super superhero john mcclain arnold schwarzenegger type who goes above and beyond the law but um, there are a lot of movies where the cops are super stupid, like or security, yeah. or they're doing stuff. And I have a theory, and I've heard people talk about the same thing, so I can't claim for this to be my original thought, is that the cops or stuff like that are characterized as being really dumb, so you are not as sad as you would be when they are eventually killed off by the like the villains. Because the kill is not meant to evoke... They don't want to evoke sadness from the viewer in these moments. They want more to keep the adrenaline high during, like, shootouts. Hmm. Whereas you look at other movies, uh, like, a lot more modern movies where people get shot. Like, a, like Tarantino's... A lot of Tarantino has shots where people get shot and it focuses on them dying. 
and there are you can't stay high like oh this is exciting because you're watching a person bleed out and it's horrible hmm. but in these i would say like these 80s action films you're someone getting shot is like the equivalent of you taking a bite of popcorn it's just a moment a moment experience like oh that guy's dead oh that guy was a cop he's killed by a bad guy those bad those rascally bad guys shooting all of our cops but at the same time you're like they're, they're kind of dumb and they deserved it so you might not be as sad so you can kind of keep that high going of this is a fun action movie and not focusing on the trauma tremendous and traumatic loss of life that is actually happening before you on screen yeah because I've watched so many like the Terminator that happens in the Terminator 2 Terminator 1 the there's a very famous scene where he goes into a police station and shoots everyone up and it's played for like sadness but then in the second one when the villains are shooting up the cops the cops are introduced being like man the ball game was good I was talking to Sally buh, 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 buh. like all these schmucks and then yeah. the big gunfight happens between the two Terminators and cops are caught in the crossfire and just killed. Hmm. But they're not focused on it all. So, yeah. it's not something they really do anymore. Yeah, I mean, that explains, I guess, like, the, the systematic reason for, like, maybe that's part of why the cops are so dumb here. I'm, the one, the thing that really stands out to me is the assault helicopters that they bring in. Because, like, there's a, there's a dialogue between the two FBI agents where they literally say to each other, we could probably only kill, like, 30% of the hostages or something. Which is so, like, <laughs> callous and... Sh it's, like, not just stupid. It's, like, a next level not giving a shit about, like, what you're supposed to be doing as your job. Um... Yeah, and that makes Which, sense, too, because, uh, like, at the time, the 80s, there was a lot of time with, like, political upheaval and stuff, is creating the idea that, because they're not the cops, they're the FBI, they're part of the federal yeah. thing, is they don't care about us. They're just here to protect the money and get rid of the bad guys. So, yeah, if they kill mm. some people in pursuit of whatever, they still get the glory and the promotion. Who gives a shit about Joe Schmo? I guess that's true. Cause yeah, I I did I totally missed that line. This viewing of we'll only kill thirty percent of the hostages, but I I completely believe those characters would say it. Yeah. But yeah. Do you have anything else to say before we move on to the next spot? Uh, I had a couple of other interesting facts. Drop them on me. Um. So apparently, the um. The director wanted the like gun fighting to feel really visceral and realistic, mm -hmm. and he used a kind of like extra powerful blank for the movie. Um, they're like more powerful than normal blanks. So oh, I guess with a... normal blanks, hmm? I th is this about like Bruce Willis almost going deaf? I heard like one out of every three words you said maybe. oh sorry i was like is this the one about jeff uh not jeff i'm saying jeff uh bruce willis almost going deaf because the gun going off next to his head oh no i hadn't heard about that at all oh okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> but that i mean that totally would make sense though with like the information that they basically had to special make new props for the more powerful blank the thing that i knew about that they had affected was apparently like most of the actors felt a little uncomfortable with them, but Alan Rickman like could not help flinching every time he fired the guns. So like apparently they had to just shoot around that. That Gruber is firing a gun, you can never actually see his face um, because if you could, you'd see him <laughs> flinching away from the gunshot. <laughs> that that is really funny. <laughs> Um, oh, in the um, scene where John McClane smashes the window out with a chair, mm -hmm. apparently they had to reshoot it multiple times because the window was so hard to break that the chair actually broke before the window did. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty intense. Yeah. 
I thought you were going to say, like, you'd hit the window and then, like, the bits would fly back and hit him or something. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, those windows are not, like, because I'm even sure those were, like, the fake movie versions of those windows. Those windows yeah. are not meant to be shattered by a dude swinging into it. Hmm. Um, so, another kind of funny factoid is just that because the title of this movie is a, like, very Western idiom. It's been really hard to translate it into other languages. Oh, I think um, I know what you're talking about. I think I've seen this one before. Yeah, so like there's a bunch of funny titles that you can find, but my favorite were the Hungarian titles. Um, so the titles for the first three Die Hard movies, like if you translate them back from Hungarian very literally, the first one is called Give Your Life Expensive. The second Die, Qual Die Hard is called your life is more exp and the third is called the life is always expensive hey that sort of fits <laughs> yeah um one thing that i like remembered having noticed but hadn't picked up on why it was happening in the movie but it was like kind of funny once i realized is um in the scene where ellis goes to gruber to betray mclean Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gruber pours him like a Coca-Cola um, and what was explained to me in the trivia was that the sort of implicit reason for this is because Ellis is always doing Coke he had probably asked Gruber for a Coke but Gruber's character being German had misunderstood what he wanted and that's why he pours him a Coca-Cola <laughs> that is pretty cool uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up um, is the I keep saying MacGruber now is, uh, is Gruber's death is um, like a very iconic cinema death hmm. and it is a death that has been um, like parodied to death ha 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 and referenced in other things uh, like what I heard one that I don't know how super true it is, but just seeing like flash cuts and stuff is Mufasa's death from the Lion King has that same shot when he is hmm. thrown off the cliff. Yeah. And he has almost his front legs move in the same way that uh, Gruber's hands move when he's falling. Like if you watch them shot by shot hmm. and that death I, from what I understand, was a parody, not a parody, but like a spin. Have you seen RoboCop? Yeah, it's been a while. But uh, do you yeah. remember the villain, how he died at the very end, like the executive? Not really. Is the Ed 209 robot is there, and at the very end, and his whole thing is he can't ever kill anyone who works for the company, is once RoboCop exposes the villain the president of the company fires him. So then hmm. Ed 209 shoots him with a bunch of bullets and he falls out a window is when he's falling out that window, it's not a person. It's clearly a claymation figure. And it's, if you look up the falling death, the body model freaks out and like the arms stretch really long. And it looks really ridiculous is that this was a spin on doing that same thing, but making it look much better using like computers and stuff. Huh. So, yeah, the the Gruber fall is not like necessarily a trope, but it's anytime you see like a down shot of someone falling out of a window, there's mm -hmm. a chance it's a callback in either the way it's shot or the situation that's happening. Yeah, you talking about this made me realize that the um, sort of iconic opening of Ghost in the Shell kind of does that shot too. Of course, there it's motoko like intentionally jumping off mm -hmm. but it's like shot from that same angle and has that same kind of feel to it where like they disappear as they get far mm -hmm. but yeah that's i would say it's probably the most iconic shot aside from mclean aside from mclean crawling towards the audience in the vent and then him yeah. slamming into the side of the window with the explosion going off hmm. i'd say those are like the three big diehard shots of the first movie yeah but uh, do you have anything else? I think we got all my best stuff. 
But uh, yeah, uh, however many years later, almost 30, 31 years later, this movie still holds up. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, like I, I thought it was a great movie, and I don't usually like this kind of movie, so I feel like that says a lot. But uh, all right, let's uh, move into the final part. We're going to talk about music in games. Mm-hmm. So I have some things, so but I want to ask you what are what did you want to talk about? Because this was uh, one of your suggestions. I mean, I I have some like games where I think they're doing interesting things with music, but also some games that I just wanted to call out um, just because they're like music. Um, I guess maybe if you want to start on like, do you have a game that has your favorite soundtrack? That is the thing I was thinking about. Is like honestly, aside from two that I have in my brain, one not being a super good specific game, soundtracks for me for games are not something I really pay attention to. Hmm. There are times in and out where like I'll catch a piece of music and I'll be like, oh man, that was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the one for me that I'm like the soundtrack that I've actually listened to outside of the fact is The Witcher Three soundtrack. The Witcher Three has very like noticeable music when it changes yeah and um like it has a great back (laughs) jumping ahead uh has a really great like battle theme and there's a number of them and they're like remixes those are really good Hmm. and then skyrim in the same vein has very iconic music that if i heard like three seconds of it i'd be like skyrim yeah but i guess as far as soundtracks go like I would say the Tony Hawk games when they came out, like the early ones, had a bunch of stuff that are memorable. Like anytime someone says ska, my brain immediately jumps to Goldfinger singing Superman, and I think of jumping over the half pipe in the warehouse in Tony Hawk One, and I'm just Man, like, yeah, that's a like great game for soundtracks that I. Oh, you cut out at the very end there. Great game for I... soundtracks. What? that i didn't even think of but no like i i this is one of the areas of gaming where i'm not Hmm. i don't be like oh man yeah the silent hill games after the fact i've heard them oh man yeah brought up akira yamioka akira yamioka yamioka Mm -hmm. does great creepy music for sure well then like some of it isn't even creepy it's just like kind of atonal Mm -hmm. and like really beautiful like I've only played Homecoming and part of two, but I used to that listen to the shit out of the, <laughs> yeah, I used to listen to the shit out of the six for the first four games. Cause there's some great music on those. My dream wish is, uh, and it may be happening. We're looking at an E3 is Konami re-releasing an improved version of the silent Hill collection for PC hmm. because I am going to make will play through all of them. That all would be of them pretty will. fun. I know you're listening to this. But, um, yeah. Uh, so, what soundtracks were you thinking of? So, like, for sure, my favorite. I think this is maybe my favorite album, period. Like, not just game soundtrack. This is probably the piece of music that I love more than any other in the world is the soundtrack from Nier Automata. Okay. Um, I almost. They. Um don't want you to tell me about it <laughs> i haven't played it yet so yeah i mean like i can just kind spoilers. of just right classically styled music but modern written in a modern way gotcha. um but it's just like really gorgeous it really hooed for the game and like I don't know. It's just a great soundtrack. I love it a lot. I'm going to move that. You'll up. probably play the games and then you'll be like, meh, this is fine. But, um, I don't know. It like strikes a tone with me. Anytime I'm like wanting to listen to music and don't have something specific in mind that one of my go-to album is that album. So nice. Um, <clears throat> some others i really love the soundtracks for the bayonetta game um they do these kind of like they're like lightly jazzy yeah um which is 
a big thing for me, but I think is like a lot of video game music is maybe more jazzy than we realize just because especially with like classical video game music Mm -hmm. like um if you hear there are people who will do like jazz versions of like some of the mario soundtracks and when you hear them with jazz instrumentation you like don't even really have to change that much about them they're already super jazzy it's just that they didn't have jazz instrumentation so you didn't hear it as jazz um, but I don't know. There's some pretty great Mario soundtracks too. I don't know if you liked any of the Mario music at all. It's like it's this thing. Where I, I notice it when it's there, and I'm like, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, like Mario Odyssey had a lot of nice music, and then the one part where the music beats you over the head, where you're running through, like within uh, what was it, New Donk City. Hmm when you're like doing the music section for that where mayor pauline is singing the theme for the game i was like that's neat Hmm. and like i have the is stuck in my head forever yeah same with legend of zelda there's not really any specific songs where i'm like that but i can hear like the lost woods theme in my brain immediately goes there yeah and then like the fairy fountain theme yeah but. Zelda's an interesting one too just because like of course the music is also a part of the game with the ocarina songs and it's mm-hmm. like funny to think that's basically a fast travel slash utility mechanic from a game but like I can still hear some of those songs in my head just from thinking about it which I don't yeah, know I think I can hear impressive. Sarah's song right now if I try yeah Yep. Did it. And then I just teleport away. (laughs) But now, for me, music in video games is always tied to specific moments. Hmm. Is where, like, where music and then the action or the the fin the impetus of action is where i am like oh man uh will already pointed out snake eater is snake <laughs> the metal gear solid 3 which is great and will is in the process of sort of playing it we he stole back his ps2 and he we bought that game and he's played bits and pieces of it over the past mm. 17 years yeah but uh, it has a great intro james bondy sounding theme and then there's just a moment in the game where you have to climb this big ass ladder, the yeah. biggest ladder of any video game I've ever seen. Like, do you know? Have you seen the ladder? I so this is like a meme that video game donkey does a lot. Is like in no. any of his videos, if someone's climbing up a ladder, it will play that song. God damn it! That's... So I'm familiar with. But have you song. seen the scene? I think I have, yeah, where it's like a silo-looking thing that you're climbing up or down. Yeah. Yeah. As I was like, when you kind of freaked out a little bit during that ladder in Thimbleweed Park, I was like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'd love to see him just playing that. Because you climb up a ladder that is, you climb up the inside of a mountain. Mm. And it's, so the game can load in this next massive sandbox. Like, that's the trick. But they hide yeah. it so well because they have the time to play the entire Snake Eater theme <laughs> while you're climbing a ladder. Um, that really sticks out to me. Hmm. To me, the company, though, that handles music game stuff the best is Rockstar. And uh, another one that is in my brain for a game that I highly recommend if you've never played it, and this is to anyone who... No one's watching this. Why am I saying this? If anyone watches this VOD, is uh, Max Payne 3 is the final level at the airport. Plays this song that is like hauntingly ethereal with like this girl singing about rain. And it sounds like it's raining almost. But while it's happening, the level is designed that there is just shit tons of glass. So Hmm. at almost any time during this song, there is just going to be a cascade of broken glass flying everywhere. Um, 
and I can very much see in my head the first time I played it, I had chosen to go up to the second floor of the like uh, the mezzanine level or whatever, and there's like a good three story drop, and I just dove off firing my gun at like eight dudes and the song fits perfectly and then as i finished i crashed down through the the uh glass thing of a like a a little shitty trinket stand and i was just losing my shit to this music and it was amazing if our thing wouldn't get muted i would play little bits of it which i feel like we're in fair use territory to be like just listen to this for like five seconds but uh and then going back to metal gear solid 3 it has an instance of one of the two best songs that i've heard during credits ever and i don't i won't keep i'll let you talk in a second but uh yeah credit songs are really important it's uh Hmm. i think it's called it's called gonna fall far by star sailor recommend it uh before i keep dominating the conversation did you have any other ones you want to talk about um i mean i had a couple uh, one soundtrack that i really like and that does a really cool thing is from um valhalla which i've talked about before but the really? like I don't remember. really cool yeah <laughs> the really cool thing they do with the soundtrack is that so like the way the game works every day you do like two shifts and and at the start of every shift there's a jukebox and you get to like pick the songs that will play during your shift and then you can unlock more songs as the game goes on mm-hmm. but it just like makes you kind of aware of the music in a way because you're like picking it and you start to like pay attention to which songs do i like and which ones do i like but not as much um i don't know i thought that was a really cool idea that is cool um, I probably talked a little bit a while back about a music, um, a like rhythm game that I was playing called Muse Dash. Maybe I think you did because you brought up a rhythm game something um, a long time ago. That if you, sorry, what? No, I'm saying I think you brought that up before. Yeah. Okay. If you kind of drop, it's an awesome game, um, which I do. Um, I don't know. It, I'm not usually a rhythm game person, I, um, but that one I liked a lot. It um, kind of makes the music, the like rhythm element is almost a bit combat-y because the levels sort of play out like a uh, endless runner game Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of like when you're hitting a button will correspond with like when you're swinging your hammer at an enemy or that kind of thing which is pretty cool gotcha and yeah a great soundtrack in my opinion nice um one another one from game a game that I've never actually played, but I really love the soundtrack for is Resident Evil Code Veronica. All right. Um, yeah, I I had the soundtrack when I was younger and used to listen to that a lot. There's like a lot of really cool orchestral things going on that I like a lot. Hmm. I just can't remember much of the music. I just remember playing that game, and that was, for me, when I had my first instances of Resident Evil going, this is dumb. <laughs> this is a dumb thing. Yeah. But, yeah, Resident, I mean, oh, man, worst piece of music from any video game comes from Resident Evil 1, the basement theme, which I hope after you're done with this, when we're, when we're just talking, I want you to look up the basement theme for Resident mm-hmm. Evil 1 and just listen to it. And then and it'll then be I'll weird. Be like, be- that was pretty bad. Because what happened was, it was, a th- it was music written by a guy who, for his portfolio, uh, was like, here's all of my music. And they were like, this is good music. Can you make more for our game? And then... He was like, yeah. 
and what he did is he got a whole bunch of other people to make that music and then went here and then from what i understand capcom find found out and went make us an original piece of music in the studio and he made the basement theme and it is atrocious and because they had paid him they're like fuck it we're gonna use it so they throw it into one room of the basement and it is so distinctly horrible compared to all of the rest of the good music that you're just like what the fuck yeah i don't even think it's in the remake Hmm. or it's the other way around where it's not in the original game but it's in the remake i don't know but yeah the basement theme is bad But yes, Code Veronica was was any other ones? So one that I was thinking about that has... It's not bad music that I feel like doesn't fit the game well all the time is actually Astral Chain, which I've been playing right now. Um, Big complaints about the game is that it has... It feels like it has some pacing issues. And some of those are discordancy between, like, the mechanics of the game, what you're supposed to be doing, and the tone that the music sets. So there's, like, a lot of scenes where the music will be doing that, da 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 You know, it's, like, really climactic, and you're like, there's a panic going on, and the story of the game is also telling me that someone's life is in moral danger, but the mechanics of the game tell me that I need to go and find a cat to rescue before I leave this part of the level and also I need to clean up 30 red crystals uh, so gotcha. it's like a the music is setting the tone of you need to be panicked and moving faster um, but that's not what you're supposed to do gotcha gotcha I've nothing pops into my brain to the same of that but I know for a fact I have had that same sort of thing where it's like okay hey game I get it calm down But um, going back to what I was saying with uh, Rockstar is Mm -hmm. Rockstar has the most, for me, synergy music game moments that just like hit me really hard. And the one game that they have that has the most of them being two is Red Dead Redemption 1 has two very impactful moments of music that one took my breath away in almost a literal sense and the other one made me cry and these will be mild spoilers i won't really i don't know if will's will's not listening or maybe he's listening i don't know uh he'll stop me at some point because this first one isn't really a spoiler and do you plan to play red dead redemption um i may at some point but i'm not bothered like i already know what the ending of the game is from listening to other people talk about it super duper uh the from what have you ever heard of the mexico crossing the mexico scene in that game i don't think so it's another thing i recommend just watching a clip of it because it's amazing is up till this point in the game it's about the halfway ish point it's just been big gunfight after big gunfight people betraying each other horrible murders racism all this stuff Then on the way to Mexico, you have this scene where, because John can't swim, so you have to stay on this tiny raft where they're throwing dynamite at you, and there's just hundreds of dudes who just want you to die, and you just kill them all, and it's very hectic, it's very stressful. But you get over to the other side of the border, your dude who's been helping you gives you a horse, and he's like, hey, ride to this next town, it's a little ways away. And you get on to this horse, and you ride up this little embankment up to this completely open, wide mesa area. And then this song just starts playing, with, and someone starts singing. And it's the first time, like, vocals have been in the game. And if you follow the road, it is... And you don't shoot at anything. The game is very well directed that at points in the music, when it's going up or coming down, like herds of wild deer will run and jump over the road while you're going and it's like it's it's like a song about catching a train or something and it's just so calming and the sun is just in the process of setting Hmm. and you're just like oh man and then it starts dying down as you see the town you're going to get into view and then by the time you're in town if you've kind of kept pace 
the song is ending as you get there and then you have like a couple bits unless you don't realize where you're supposed to go and then you start the next mission and it was just like oh man that was the most intense form of catharsis i'd had in recent memory i was just like oh everything just poured out of me and i was like that felt good that does sound like a pretty great gaming moment and then the game pulls the same trick again sort of with not as artistically but with a moment and then song that hits in an even more powerful way to someone like me is uh spoilers for the end of red dead redemption five seconds for anyone who doesn't want to hear it can get out now one two three four five is you die at the end of the game (laughs) is uh just to kind of set it up so this sort of makes sense is through the whole game john has been promised by the u.s government like hey if you can take care of all your old gang members we'll let you go you can be with your wife and kid again and it'll be great and at the end of the game you get the last dude actually an odd thing you don't actually get the last dude he kills himself so you don't get the the pleasure of doing it um but you have this almost like hour hour and a half long section where you're in the resolution of the game it seems where you're just back at home with your wife and kid you're doing ranch shit and you're dealing with the fact that you haven't been the greatest dad but like it's all coming around and it's fine and then after you do some mundane fucking around the house things you look out the window and you just see coming over the mountain is just almost the entire u.s army Hmm. and you just have this section where you have to hold them off and you kill like what seems to be everyone in the state of utah and you're like okay we're good and then you hear more sound you look over and coming over the other hill adjacent is like three times as many men and by this point all of your allies who are helping you have been gunned down so it's just john and his kid and his wife and he knows he can't hold them back so Mm. he takes them out into the barn he puts them on a horse and he's like i'll be right behind you you gotta go his family's like no don't go and sends him away and then in this moment that is like the first bit of this micro hit that's going to build up over the next like hour is john turns and he looks out of the barn and he sees like there's like 30 dudes there like forming a firing line and he knows he can't win he takes a deep breath and then he goes out the game immediately goes into bullet time the red dead and you have enough that you can kill six dudes and then after you kill the six they gun you down and then the, it seems like the game's going to end and that st- that the hurt starts immediately of like is this where the game ends this hurts so much john was a great character is you then get control of the sun you ride back you find your dad dead the game then jumps six years in the future you're now his grown-up son and you go after the man who killed your father and you have a duel with him and you win and then what the game does which i brought up in a previous podcast is still some of my it's probably my favorite still visual splash design thing in any game ever is when the game started after you did like the prologue it did like the red and white flash screen with john's head and then it did red dead redemption on the right is after you kill this dude it does the splash screen red dead redemption western sound and then with the sun's head on the left so it does like a full thing Hmm. and then the credits start and you're like yeah i got him i should feel really good and then this very soft guitar and piano music start and it starts singing this very somber song about like your hands upon the song is called dead man's gun and i listen to it like once a month and it's this song about you have nothing left and you're using the gun of a dead man to get vengeance and you just start realizing that what you've just done has undermined the entire game like john marston's whole mission was to put his family in a spot where they never would have to live the life he lived and by gunning down a former u.s marshal jack marston is now completely gone into the life of an outlaw even though at the time it feels like you're doing the right thing by getting vengeance for your pa because it's the west but you're also getting vengeance in the early 1900s world war one is starting where that's not the way of the world anymore 
Hmm. So you're just left to, did I just completely waste John Marston's life? And I just, the song goes for like three and a half minutes and I just put the controller down side and then I touched my face and it was wet and I had some tears in my eyes and I was like, oh my God, that was good. And then when the game started up again, I pushed a, I pushed a drunk Mexican officer off the top of a mountain and I felt better. But nice. that is, aside from the snake eater to credits that I mentioned earlier, are the two times in video games that made me cry. Hmm. where the game just leaves you with a somber music track and then just thinking about the implications of everything you've done in the game up to that point. Yeah. Both games have great post-credit, like, oh, fuck, (laughs) moments. So sorry for talking for, like, 30 minutes. No, that's good, actually. I think you did much better with this assignment, though. So it's good that you're filling some time. But yeah, those when for music, I can't. I'm sure there are some other ones. I'm trying to think of like more modern ones. Hmm. Uh, Wet, which is a terrible video game, has a really good soundtrack. That had like the demo. I think you can still play on PS3. Mm-hmm. Is it's this very very mediocre third person shooter whose whole gimmick is when you go into bullet time mode you control you have access to two guns that you can control in two different directions or whatever yeah but it's horrible the characters suck the first half of the demo of the first level is just normal dude shooting in like a gross like terribly animated game world but then you go through a doorway for the second half and the color palette of the game completely changes where like the scenery turns red and you're just like a white outline and it starts playing this song called like zombie killer in the wild wild west which is like this weird techno country rock song and it just starts throwing a bunch of like shitty one hit like they only have like one hp life thing so you're just gunning down all these dudes to this really cool song hmm and aside from that the game sucks but that's another one that has stood out to me i got really scared yeah. my mom just texted me and she no, never does unless something goes wrong but she just texted to say that she loves me and i love you too mom <laughs> i got really worried but yeah modern aside from like what i said with witcher 3 that had a good soundtrack but even that doesn't have any like specific music at this moment hmm. metal gear solid 4 has a good one have you seen anything about the the microwave hallway scene uh uh-uh. that i would i don't know how iconic outside of fans of the metal gear series but it's another emotional gut punch scene where basically snake oh this one will be a much shorter synopsis is at this point in the game snake's like really old and he's, he's an old clone or whatever and he's on a suicide mission and you get to this hallway that is, for some fucking reason, just lined with microwaves that are a defense mechanism. Which, I think they sort of explain how it's supposed to work. Like, I think what it is is normally they work at full potential and will just fry anything that go in it. But you somehow lessen the amount, but it's still there. So you you have to walk through this microwave hallway as an old man wearing, like, this electronic suit. And as you're walking bits are sparking off of you and you're old so you lose the ability to walk and while you're playing on the bottom screen the top half of your screen is showing all of your allies in this big fight and they're like losing and it's playing this very mellow dramatic sweeping music and you know that if you can get to the end of this hallway by mashing the ever-living fuck out of triangle you'll be able to hit the magic button that stops all your friends from dying and it, that one was like, oh my god! Like it got to the point where it's physically painful to keep hitting the triangle button, because you have to keep hitting it constantly for like three minutes. So Ugh, I like, hate having to mash buttons, and for three minutes, it's I'm probably overstating. It feels like three minutes, but like when I look back on, it, I'm like, it matches so well with how Snake is doing because he's just dying in this hallway, mm. and there's parts where like when you stop hitting it. He, like, lays on the ground and starts, like, coughing up blood and, like, psyching himself up to move a little bit more. So you can 
take intermittent breaks to like let your thumb rest <laughs> or like you switch over to your other finger yeah so it's like a weird kajiba like matching real life to game moment but it's just playing mm. this somber sweeping orchestral score as you're dying and then you fix everything because it's metal gear but yeah but that that was oh fuck that was in 2008 i'm trying to think of anything past 2015 yeah and yeah i think most of the ones that i wrote down were older games i don't know Near Automata is pretty new. I think that was 2016, 2015. Sorry, what? Like, wasn't Near Automata like 2015 yeah, or later? Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty new one. Yeah. Okay. Man, I'm just trying to think of some other. One. I'm trying to think of. I know there are examples of games where I've played it when they do this, of where there is like a licensed soundtrack that can play mm-hmm. like when you're in cars or when you're doing stuff where you have the ability to change the music wherever you want. but for Yeah, I mean, this, Grand Theft Auto did that. Yeah, but well, yeah. It's, they have that soundtrack that normally when you're playing you have the control over, but then during a specific sequence, it takes that one, it takes a specific song from that soundtrack and then plays it over the scenario, like, non-diegetically. Hmm. Oh, uh, Saints Row 4 had some pretty good goofy music, goofy music moments. Like, yeah. uh, you're escaping naked through, um, like, this alien spaceship that you're held hostage in, and you get into, like, this floating car sedan spaceship, and you have to, like, do a Death Star-style trench run out of this thing, and your character's mm-hmm. like, oh, man, we gotta pump up the super tunes, I'm getting some things from Earth, and you're, like, expecting, um some insane like over the top like speed metal song but it starts playing what is love and you're kind of like okay and it just fits <laughs> while you're just kind of like dun, 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 as you're just dodging explosions and he's like and then he just starts singing along to it and that's pretty wonderful and then at the beginning yeah. of that game it's a game i really recommend playing if you're into like goofy sandbox games is uh you save the world from a nuclear strike by climbing up the side of the missile as it's flying into orbit and disassembling it to Aerosmith's I don't want to miss a thing. Like calling back to uh, Armageddon, that movie with also Bruce Willis full circle. And <laughs> uh, yeah, those are, that's a newer one. That was good. That that was not emotionally impactful. It just made me laugh that those were the music choices, and like I'm sure they were doing it for comedy rather than deep, deep emotional yeah. feels. But I mean, comedy is like a good thing to evoke too. So, God of War had a good soundtrack. Hmm. Have you not played that yet? Mm-mm. Oh man. That game is so good. Yeah. When we move up there, if you haven't played it by then, you need to borrow it and play it. We could stream it. Um, we'll see. It's I don't know. It's not right now. Oh, sorry. I probably what? should play it. What What did you say? I didn't catch the first part. Oh, I just said it's not at the. I don't know. Like I, I. I don't know. I feel like I'd probably enjoy it if I played it, but I just don't have any desire to, and I don't know why that is. I guess I sort of get it. Like, I kind of lost... I didn't like Kratos at the end of God of War 1. I mean, 3, I hated. I mean, I haven't played any of them. Oh, well, that's even better. (laughs) Well, is it? (laughs) That is a game, yeah, yeah, I think you'd still enjoy it, but it is a game where if you've played the previous three and you see how much of a shit dick he is and then getting to experience him as a changed character is pretty mm. impactful. But no, that had some moments where like you stop and look over a vista and it plays some like really Celtic, Greek, Nor- Norwegian-y music and you're just like, oh man, that was really pretty. Yeah. And then uh, the Both, music. Um, oh, sorry. Oh. I was gonna say the music. Gonna at say... The... <laughs> you go. Yeah. You go. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. The music they do is. It didn't make me cry, but the music they picked to play at the end of Deadly Premonitions ending also made me go, yeah. So that was another good ending. I really and hope now you, you can get be excited for the next one. 
Oh man, I hope you get Origins and I hope you play it. I yeah, if I I'll probably like wait to see if it goes on sale at some point. Um, but I'd definitely like to play it. If it is not an improved version of the game, like it still has all the messy bugs that the normal version does, then I yes, I highly recommend waiting for it yeah. to be cheap. Yeah, because it's thirty dollars right now, which is okay. That feels like it's just a port. I mean, with... not mess. I'd rather pay fifteen. Yep, I think when I got Deadly Premonition, I got it for like seven dollars, and then I played it, and I was like, man, hmm. that was a great price. <laughs> But sorry, I was interrupting you when you were trying to say something else. Oh, I, I don't know. I was just going to throw out some other... I guess this is an old game and a new game by the same person, basically. I think both Castlevania and Bloodstained. Or at least Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Bloodstained. Both had really... Um, say, like, a lot of those are just soundtracks where you're just like, this is the jam huh I'm trying to I can't really remember too much of how Symphony of the Night sounded but some of the songs I mean that's another soundtrack that's on my um, on in my like iTunes library and I will just listen to is the Symphony of the Night soundtrack some of it's really good gotcha but all right yeah, have anything else? I think I am pretty much covered when it comes to music. Yeah, I think the only other one I had written down was Undertale, but just like the good soundtrack. I know, and, okay. and we have to bring it up in every episode. Because Will was like, current. what about this? And I was like, yeah, fucking I guess. But, so the thing that makes me laugh about that game is you only hear the... Oh, oh did our stream crash? I don't know, since I can't have it up oh, no we're still good it just error occurred black screen on my thing ah. uh it's like the most iconic piece of music i would say is megalovania yeah in that, which i you, don't think is the best song in it but but uh well i'll ask you what your favorite is in a second but like i did a pacifist run and you don't even get to hear that song if you do the pacifist run Mm. so like, like oh, Megalovania from Undertale I was like I don't know what that is and then I heard it I'm like that's pretty good where is this it's like oh it's when you murder fight Sans who's now in Smash Brothers and now I'm sad mm. but uh, yeah what, what's your, what do you think is the best song in sorry Undertale? what what do you think is the best song in Undertale for me so I think objectively it's probably Hopes and Dream um, but I also really like the boss song that plays when you fight Moff. When you fight the, who? Like, Moffat, the like oh. spider girl. Mm. I like her song a lot. Okay. But that's just because I tend to like sort of atonal music. What was the Hopes and Dreams song? Like when? when is that playing? I don't actually remember when it plays. It's just... I don't know. This is another game where I like have the soundtrack on my phone, so I listen to it a fair amount. But gotcha. That Toby Fox does know how to make some music. Yep. Yep. But all right, let's. Uh, I guess we'll wrap it up now after we talked about that garbage. <laughs> Take that, Toby Fox! Ha ha! Impotent rage. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think we had talked about it. I think what we were planning to do for the movie for this next one was Kill Bill, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are good. Looking forward to it. Well, I, one thing I was curious about, if we couldn't think of a uh, video game topic, is did we want to do, like, a double feature of Kill Bill 1 and Kill Bill 2? Uh, yeah, I guess we could do that. Because uh, right now I, I couldn't think of a specific topic unless we wanted to like game jam again. Yeah. But well, we'd had that um, other idea where you could talk about like favorite games in any given genre. But uh, okay, um, I'm happy to do double feature also. What do you so. want to do? This is I would say this is maybe this is your baby for the channel. It's what? Do what? You, this is your baby. 
my baby like the, uh, podcast, the podcast so what do you want to do do you want to do double feature or do you want to talk about your favorite video games oh let's do double feature uh, we're gonna we're always gonna need new game topics so sounds good because it's a game where like i mean it's a movie that is kind of like one long movie split into two hmm. so the resolution doesn't come until kill bill volume two yeah so I, I i would like to talk about them all as, as one okay cool cool well uh thanks for everyone who stopped by that's was i guess it was mostly just us us we d- good good job being here robert yep i was here you were here uh fabulous al Riot was here for a little bit play monster hunter right now probably i don't know he's he's having a lot of trouble with um one specific boss Hmm. So, but that being said, tune in next time for when we talk about both of the Kill Bill movies. Indeed, uh, any, and a news item. What did you say? Probably. I said and a news item. And a news item, which I keep forgetting about, but Robert <laughs> brings it home, and it's always good, always tasty. I do my best. I look forward to the first pilot episode of uh, uh, Theodore Sprinklebottoms, or <laughs> whatever that was. I wish to know the more. Teddy Sprinklebum. Teddy Sprinklebum. But uh, yeah, hope to see you guys tomorrow. We're going to be doing Fallout in the morning, and then Evil Within in the afternoon. And we hit 100 followers. Ah! So we'll be doing a thing for that on Saturday. We're still figuring out what it is, but it will involve Will wearing a fancy shirt and probably drinking ranch. And, Excellent. And he's super excited for both of those things. It's what the people demand. Indeed. But all right, we'll see you guys next time. Indeed. Bye. Bye. In about five seconds. Ha ha, tricked you. <laughs> I forgot that the raid takes like five seconds to spool up. <laughs> ah, but I did manage to clear a copyright claim off of one of our videos, so it's all good. Nice. But bye for real, though. <laughs>